Appears to be, Judge. Um, our first witness is uh, Nicholas Smith. Um, Mr. Binger has informed me that, you know, I guess I can let him tell you this, but that he has two juvenile adjudications. Um, the year, can you tell me the years, Tom? They're both from April 30th, 2014, here in Kenosha. So I, I don't know how last oh, time. Was, was he at the time? He would have been 16. Now 23. Um, <clears throat> hand me the. Uh, there have been other criminal cases since then. Um, there were three or four pending criminal cases that were resolved with pleas, uh, to, one to disorderly conduct and one to violation of a temporary restraining order. That was from April of 2016. And then in May of this year, both of those uh, adult convictions were expunged. persistent uh, lawless behavior. Um, give me the, uh, I guess I could, I, I guess I have the ability to look at it. I can give you the case numbers if you like. 14JV36. JV 36. Fourteen JV one oh one.
that standing? I'm going to count it as two. So the question is, have you ever been adjudicated? Delinquent, not convicted of a crime, right? Right. Okay. All right. Just so you understand that, Mr. Smith? Okay. And that's the only thing you answer is that number? Okay, ready to go? I am ready. Okay. Can you arrest the front of the jury first? Yeah, please do. Uh, would you come down, please? Yes. All right, um, you may be seated. Um, welcome back, and a um, couple of things. Uh, first off, the um, um, there was testimony given by um, Brandon Kramen, <clears throat> an employee of the FBI, which was incomplete, it was interrupted, and um, because it was interrupted, it wasn't heard in full, and for that reason, uh, I'm going to strike all of that testimony, and you must disregard that entirely. Any question about that? Okay. Uh, number two, um, the seventh count of the information uh, accused the defendant of violation of a curfew, and that case is no longer part of the action here. So the information remains with six in it, and I'll instruct you at the close of the case. But the seventh count of curfew violation is no longer part of the contest here. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Binger. Your Honor, um, the state formally rests its case. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Sarafasi, the defense. Yes, Your Honor. We would call Nicholas Smith. Raise your right hand. To sign this letter, testimony about to give in this matter be the truth, the whole truth, and the truth to so help you guys. Can we be seated? Sir, will you please state your name and spell it uh, slowly for Madam Nicholas Reporter. Smith, N I C H O L A S Smith, S M I T T H. And Mr. Smith, um, I'm not looking for your specific physical address, but where do you live? Here in Kenosha. And how old are you right now? 23. Have you um, ever been judic adjudicated delinquent in the past? Yes, I believe. How many times? What does that mean? Can you clarify what that means? Of, of how many offenses were you adjudged a juvenile delinquent? One, I believe, as a delinquent. If I told you it was two? It might be. Okay. Now, are you currently employed, sir? Yes. Um, and what kind of work do you do? I work at a factory. Right. And um, if I could, uh, have you, are you familiar with uh, a business called CarSource? Yes, I am. And how are you familiar with that business? 
I worked for them. You worked for them? Yes, I worked for CarSource, and my, I've known the owners for 10 years. And who are the owners? Um, Sam, Sal, uh, their dad, their mom, and their... Uh, and it, do you remember when you worked for them specifically? 2018 to 2019. So you worked for them 2018 to 2019, but you've known them for about a decade? Close to a decade, yes. And what I want to do, if I can, is um, uh, direct your attention to uh, August 24th of 2020, OK? OK. Uh, so that would be the day prior to the shootings involving Mr. Rittenhouse. Yes. On that day, uh, did you have any contact at all with anybody from CarSource? Yes, I did. And who was that contact with? Sam. Okay. Can you explain to the jury what that contact was? Uh, the night of the 24th, uh, I'd received a phone call from Sam stating that his uh, car doctor was on fire and asked if we could do anything. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you. So I'm going to show you, we've heard this at length here, but um, if I said to you the car doctor has been previously pointed out as this car source right here between 59th and 60th, is that fair? Correct. Okay, and that is uh, what is commonly known to you as the car doctor? Correct. All right, and you had said that Sam had asked you for your assistance. Me and one other. Do you know? Do you have? Do you know who that was? I felt one other person. Yeah. Yes, that was Justin Hamilton. And it, to your knowledge, did Mr. Hamilton had he worked for CarSource in the past? For ten years, yes. And on the twenty fourth, what was? Uh, what were you asked to do? Sam had asked if we could uh, do anything about the fires. Asked both of us. And did you? Yes. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you did? Um, approximately around 9 o'clock, I'd received a phone call from Sam stating that the car doctor was on fire and asked if we could do anything. And then not too long after, I received a phone call from Justin stating that he was going to car doctor to put out the fires. Um, when they arrived, Justin and his son, Austin, who was a previous employer for car source as well, um, when they arrived, uh, we called Sam, and Sam had said that the body shop door, garage door, was unlocked and to gain entry so that we could access the power washers and the buckets with inside the car source so that we could put out the fires. So was Sam, uh, he wasn't down there with you, is that fair? No, he was not. Okay. He just had given you guys information as to what he was hoping that you would do? Correct. And the information as to... Um, well, I'll ask it to you this way. Was the car doctor building locked? No. The front door was, but the back door was not. The body shop door. And did you gain access then to the, to the shop? Correct. He gave us permission. And what did you do upon gaining? Uh, we turned on the lights inside the building so that we could locate the uh, power washer and all the buckets. And we proceeded to unlock the front door and put out the fires and we had numerous amounts of uh, bystanders help us as well that were also helping us put out the fires. Now on the 24th, was there anybody there um, physically protecting the business? No. And when you got there, what was the condition, I'll ask you, were there fires going on at that point? Or yes. Not? And that was at the, the car doctor location? Correct. So were you able then to combat the fires, deal with those fires? Correct. Okay. Um, at any point on the 24th, did you see um, anybody associated with car source or car doctor down there? Uh, in the morning of the 24th, yes. Morning of the 24th or the 25th? Not at that night, no, I did not. The morning of the 25th, I did. Okay, Sorry. so, okay, so 24th, you're putting out the fires. Correct. You then go home at some point? 
Correct. What time do you think you left the car, Doctor? Just 1 a.m. Around 1 a.m. Anywhere between 12 a.m. and 2 a.m. Now if I can ask you about the 25th. Um, on the 25th, do you have any contact with anybody from Car Source? Yes, I do. And who is that? Sam. And how do you have contact with Sam? He calls me in the morning of the 25th asking if I could provide assistance to watch over the building later in that night. He called me and uh, Justin Hamilton. So at that point, he's not asking you to, if I have this right, he's not asking you to put out fires. He's asking for help protecting the business. Is that correct? What and how do you respond to that? I say yes. I can, I can help him. I can watch over the building. And have you at that point kind of formulated a plan on what you're going to do? Yes. And what's that plan? Um, I had called my other friends that who also had previously worked there, and our plan was we were going to set up on the roof and stay there most of the night watching the building. And when you say that you had talked to your or were planning on talking to your friends, who were they? Austin Hamilton, Colin Doherty, and Justin Hamilton. And did you uh, have contact with those people at some point on the 25th? Correct. Uh, can you, I'll ask it this way. What time did you get the call from Sam? Early in the morning, anywhere between 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Not 10 p.m., 10 a.m. And what time do you think you had um, contact with or spoke to uh, the Hamiltons, the people that you were talking about? Uh, around 11 a.m. They had they first called me, and then I called Colin, and that was so around 11 a.m. So after 11 a.m., you is it fair to say that you believe you have like a plan in your head and people to help you with that plan? Correct. Um, after 11 a.m. Um, is there anything else or is there something that happens uh, that puts you in contact with anybody else that ends up there that night? Yes. And who is that? Dominic Black. And can you tell the jury what that contact with Mr. Black was? I had noticed uh, Dominic Black around the afternoon, 3 or 4 p.m. Uh, he was downtown and I needed somebody to give me a ride to go buy some body armor because I had not planned on being armed that night. Um, and he said he would give me a ride and Kyle was with him. Uh, they came to my house around 4 p.m., 3 or 4 p.m. in that afternoon, picked me up, and I do not remember exactly what transpired after that, but I ended up, uh, Kyle ended up lending me his body armor and dropping me off, and they asked where I was going. Okay, I'm gonna slow you down for a second. Correct. Okay, so um, you had said that you saw a Snapchat. Correct. I'm not familiar with Snapchat, but so it's like a video or something? Yes, correct. I saw a Snapchat video of Dominic downtown, and Kenosha. you then from that Snapchat reached back out to him? Correct. I reached out to Dominic. And you had mentioned that you were looking for or wanted uh, some, some body armor, right? Correct. And that, you tell me what you wanted that for. I had not planned on being armed, and I wanted a means of protecting myself, and body armor was the next best suit for it. Now, you had said that you didn't plan on being armed. Um, was there a particular reason that you didn't plan on being armed? We planned on being on the roof, and I see no reason that I was going to need a, to be armed. Based on your location? Correct. We were going to be on the roof. I did and not see, foresee myself needing a firearm or having any confrontation with anyone needing to have a firearm. And you had said that, if I have it right, that um, Kyle Rittenhouse then had offered you his body armor. Correct. So did you accept that? Yes, I did. So to your now, and if you know, Mr. did Mr. Rittenhouse say anything that would lead you to believe that he had another, like he had two sets of body armor or anything else? No, he did not. So what time, so you go down to Car Source, right? Correct. And who do you go there with on the 25th? 
myself at first, and then I ended up meeting Kyle and Dominic there after I'd left my house about 15 minutes. I'd arrived at Car Source, and they met me there within 10, 15 minutes of being there. And was that a, a, a planned kind of location meeting? Yes. Um, were you aware whether or not Mr. Rittenhouse and or Mr. Black had spoken to anybody from Car Source earlier that morning? I was not aware. So you, if I have this right, you're there about four o'clock. I arrived there, I would say five o'clock. We went to go get uh, the body armor around four o'clock. So you, and which car source do you arrive at? Uh, 59th Street location, car doctor. And you said shortly thereafter, uh, Mr. Rittenhouse and Mr. Black arrive? Correct. And what do you do, what happens then? I meet with the owner of uh, car source, Sam, and tell him what's gonna be going on. Okay, so at about five-ish on yeah. the 25th, you have contact with the person you know to be Sam? Correct. And he, that is at the 59th Street car doctor location? Correct. And when you get there and you see Sam, what does he do? Uh, gives me a hug and tells me thank you for coming. He didn't tell you at any point to get off that property? No, he did not. He didn't tell you that you were trespassing or anything like that? No, he did not. Was there any conversation that you had with Sam uh, relating to any, any type of payment or were you doing this for free or how was this gonna happen? When I had arrived at the location, uh, he said he would throw, throw me some money to split between the guys that were helping us. And did he ever do that? No, he did not. So you, you hug Sam, you, you talk to him for a little bit. Does he, what does he do, if anything, in terms of, and of helping you guys with buildings and things like that? Getting into buildings, anything like that? He uh, gives me a set of keys to the 59th Street location. So that's the car doctor location? Car doctor, yes, correct. Okay. So he hands you a set of keys so you can go in? Correct. Well, he had actually, um, we talked briefly, and then he said he was actually heading home, uh, and that his brother Sal uh, would give us a ride over to the 63rd Street location because he was locking up, and that his brother Sal would give me the keys. And did you end up meeting up with his brother Sal? Correct. His brother was there. And did his brother Sal then give you the keys? Correct. You had testified that there was a plan that you had a plan to be on the roof of that building. Correct. How were you planning on getting up there? A ladder. And where was, if you know, well, how did you know that you, there was a ladder there? Uh, I had previously worked there and knew there were ladders and Sam had also showed me where the ladders were at the car doctor. And when you say Sam showed you where the ladders were, do you mean on the 25th? Yes, correct. So you then make contact with Sal. Correct. And are there other people there to help uh, you protect the car doctor? Not at the moment. Uh, when we had arrived at the 63rd Street location, we'd stood around for about 10 minutes, and that's when uh, another group of individuals in their cars had pulled up and asked if we needed any assistance that night. And what did you say? I said if they want to, we'd appreciate it. Okay. Uh, did you know who they were before they got there? No, I did not. Do you know the names of any of those people today? I know one of the names. And who is that? Ryan Belch. And to be fair, um, at the 59th Street car source, Dominic Black is armed, is that right? Correct. And Mr. Rittenhouse is armed as well? Correct. Mr. Bulch? Correct. Okay. So how long are you at the car source, car doctor, before Sal leaves? We were not at car doctor when these people arrived. We were, he gave us a ride from car doctor to the 63rd Street location, and that's where we met these people. And then- Sa Okay, hold on. Sal gave who a ride? Me, Dominic, and Kyle. 
We were waiting for uh, Justin, Colin, and Austin to get there. And Sal, do you remember the car he gave you? I don't not, Do you remember the make of car he gave you a ride in? It was either a Mercedes or a BMW. And you went from 63rd down to 59th? No, 59th to 63rd. Now, there has been, uh, this jury has seen a photograph. Correct. Where was that photograph taken? 63rd. Okay. That's 30. Yes, I am. And which one of those people is you? I'm the one wearing the red cross on the helmet, the white helmet. Okay, so you're fourth from the right? Correct. Okay, and there's been testimony that the guy on the far left is Sal, is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, after that photo is taken, does Sal ever tell you? I want you to leave here. I don't want you here. You're causing problems. Anything? Does he say anything that no. would indicate he doesn't want your presence? No. He was very grateful for our presence. So what happens after Sal leaves? Can you tell me where everybody goes, if you know? Yes. Um, actually, shortly before, shortly after Sam had left, uh, another group of Latino Americans had uh, arrived in the parking lot with uh, melee weapons, at, telling us that they could watch that location for us for that night. And after that, we had made our, uh, we'd walked down to 59th Street location to meet up with Austin, Justin, and Colin. And when you get to the 59th Street location, uh, who's with you? Um, Ryan Belsh, two of his friends, it was either two or three of his friends, uh, Colin, Dominic, Kyle, Justin, and Austin. And are there, for lack of a better term, kind of, uh, locations that people are going to kind of be at for the night correct and what is your what is your location going to be the roof and if only if you know do you know what kyle's location is going to be did not state where he was going to be i'll ask it to you this way was he on the roof with you no um at some point when you're on the roof do the protesters, rioters, whatever, do they move, are they starting to move south down Sheridan Road? That is correct. And about what time is that? They had previously done it before I went on the roof as well. Okay. Um, around, I would say 8.30. And at that point, are you on the roof? I am not on the roof at that point, no. Once they, once they start moving south on Sheridan, do you take a position on the roof? After they dissipate within 10 minutes, I do take position on the roof, yes. And while you're on the roof, um, does anything happen to you? Uh, yes, our group, we get uh, chemical bombed from the protesters. And when you say chemical bombed, can you just explain kind of what you believe that means? Um, I believe it was an ammonia and bleach bomb that they made inside of a plastic bottle and threw it up on the roof. Now, to be fair, you didn't see who did that, right? No, I did not see who did that. And anything else that was happening to you while you were on the roof other than the ammonium? Bricks. Bomb? They were throwing bricks at us. And again, to be fair, you're not sure who that was. No, I am not. You um, might not have known that night, but there was a gentleman there by the name of uh, Joseph Rosenbaum. Correct. That night, did you see him? No, I did not. I was not paying attention. So there was uh, no contact between you and Mr. Rosenbaum? No, there was not. Did you see um, Mr. Mr. Rittenhouse that evening? Yes, I did. And can you describe uh, what, if anything, you noticed that he was doing? Uh, he was standing in the parking lot. Okay. There's been testimony about him repeatedly yelling, medic, 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 throughout the evening. Did you ever see him do anything? Uh, as it relates to being a medic? Um, I do not know. I was not paying attention. Okay. Do you have any medical training? Some. Okay. Um, is that in part the reason for the Correct. cross on the hat? 
And can you just briefly tell us a little bit about your medical training? Uh, my brother, who was an infantryman in the Marine Corps, has taught me CLS, Combat Life Saving, which is... Yes, ma'am. Um, my brother, who was in the infantry, was in the infantry in the Marine Corps, had taught me uh, CLS, Combat Life Saving, and taught me briefly on what to do with gunshot wounds, uh, lacerations, and things like that. Was there any, at any point that evening, sir, did you um, become armed? Yes, I did. And when was that? When the first crowd had uh, pushed towards us, when the police had pushed the first crowd down Sheridan Road, uh, Ryan Belch handed me off his pistol and said, just in case. And did you feel at that point that it was necessary or not? Yes and no. Okay. I'll um, explain it. Yes, because there was a massive amount of people. I would say anywhere between 150 to 250 people. No, because I didn't see any need to have any. I had non-lethal. Uh, was your location a factor in that at all? Yes, it was. I was on the ground at that point. Okay. Um, did you then move back up to the roof? I had not moved up to the roof yet. That was when I had moved up to the roof. Uh, when the crowd had engaged us, not engaged us, uh, pushed towards us, we uh, the people that were going to be on the roof had, at that time, figured this is a good time to go on the roof because the crowd had dissipated and pushed themselves back towards the courthouse. And that's when we went on the roof. And do you, um, when you're on the roof, uh, there's been videos shown. Uh, do you see uh, Kyle Rittenhouse at any point after you go back up on the roof? On the roof? Um, a couple times throughout the night I see him walking around. Okay, so you see him... At, if this is fair, has he left your location and is he moving from location to location? Correct. At some point that evening then, do you hear what you believe to be gunshots? That is correct. All right, and when you hear those, where are you? I am on the roof. And so to be fair, you don't see what had happened, is that right? No, I do not. And there has been testimony regarding two instances, one involving Mr. Rosenbaum, the other involving Mr. Huber uh, and Mr. Grosskreutz. Do you see either one of those happenings? No, I do not. Is there a time, well, let me ask you this, when, when you hear the shooting, do you get off the roof? I get off the roof uh, because Dominic had received a phone call at the time I had not known we received a phone call from, and he had stated that we have to leave. It is getting uh, hectic. And the prior events that just occurred, gunshots, um, we all concluded that that was safe bet, that it was getting crazy. So we'd all, everybody that was on the roof had now got off the roof. So when you get off the roof, do you see Kyle Rittenhouse? Yes, I do. And where do you see him? Inside the shops and down. And how does he look to you? Um, sweating, pale. Does he say anything? Uh, he repeats, uh, I just shot someone over and over, and I believe at some point he did say he had to shoot someone. Um, what happens then? I tell him to walk outside and turn himself in. That was a safe bet for him. And I told him to walk outside, and he had said, I had to. I had to shoot someone. And at that point, I'd left the location because I was in fear that the protesters were going to come to that location. Okay, one moment. <coughs> Mr. Smith, I don't have any other questions for you. Thank you for your time. May I proceed, Your Honor? Go ahead. Mr. Smith, you have actually two juvenile adjudications for uh, violations of the law, correct? I believe so, yes. On April 30th, 2000. No, 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 no. Um, 
His answer was, I might. He didn't answer. I, 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 I don't think we conducted the usual discussion prior, and uh, we didn't. And um, I explicitly said two, and I don't know what happened, but the, the matter is covered. Move on to something else. So, uh, Mr. Smith, you indicated that you met up with the defendant and Dominic Black and borrowed the defendant's body armor. Is that right? That is correct. Can you describe that for us, please? What the is body that? armor? Yes. Uh, it's a plate carrier. It's a vest. Um, yeah, a vest. So it's not like a suit vest. No, it is not. It's like an armor vest that you would see somebody in the military wearing. What is it made out of? Um, I cannot, I do not know, but it does have uh, body armor inside it, uh, soft armor panels. Do you know what it is designed to stop? Or bullets. Protect? What kind of bullets? Um, it was 3A, so 357. Anything up to 357. A 357 is a caliber that's typically seen in handguns, correct? That is correct. This is not the type of body armor that would stop a rifle, correct? That is correct. You're familiar with the AR-15s that the defendant and Dominic Black had, correct? That is correct. Have you ever shot or used one of those? In the past, yes, I have. Those typically fire 223 or 556 caliber, is that right? That is correct. And that's the type of caliber that would go through your your vest. That is correct. Where physically in the world did you go with the defendant to pick up that body armor on Tuesday, August 25th? I do not recall where I went. I know it, I'm pretty sure we left to go to my bank to pull out money. Um, I do not remember what transpires afterwards, but Kyle does end up giving me his body armor because we never went and got mine. I do not remember why or what transpired to why I did not, we did not go and get it but Kyle does end up giving me his body armor. If I understood your testimony correctly, Dominic Black and the defendant came to pick you up that day. Is that right? That is correct. And I'm not going to ask you your address, but you live relatively within walking distance of this area, correct? That is correct. And they didn't pick you up to drive you to this area. They drove you someplace west or south of here, correct? I do not remember. When they came to pick you up, whose vehicle were they driving? Dominic's. Was the plate carrier body armor already in the vehicle? Yes, it was. From the defendant? That is correct, the defendant's body armor. And you said that you chose not to have a gun that night because you felt the body armor would be sufficient protection. Is that fair to say? That is correct. What were you worried about? Um, the way at the previous nights of what I'd seen, I was worried somebody was going to shoot me or anything. You know, I just wanted a means of protection. What had you seen on the previous night that made you feel that while you were protecting a business here in Kenosha, someone was going to shoot you? A lot of individuals armed with rifles and pistols and acting irate throughout the nights. Did you see or hear of anyone who actually shot anyone on those prior nights? No, I did not. But it's fair to say that when you came downtown on Tuesday, August 25th, you were concerned about the potential of violence, correct? That is correct. You were particularly concerned that that violence would come from the people on the street, the protesters, demonstrators, whatever word you want to call them. Is that fair to say? That is correct. You felt that they not only posed a danger to the physical property you were at, but you personally for guarding that property. Is that, that fair is to correct. say? 
When is the last time before August 25th, 2020, that you worked for Sal or Sam or any member of their family? 2019. I want to make sure we're very precise about the properties that we're talking about. Um, you've got a map there behind you, and I'm going to represent to you, Mr. Smith, that there is a location uh, that is marked car source that is on the northeast corner of 59th Street and Sheridan Road. Do you see that labeled car source? Yes, I do. Would you agree with me that that location is properly called car source? The dealership or the mechanic shop? The one that's on the northeast corner. I have a laser pointer if that would help. Yes, it would. I'm talking about this location here. Yes, that is uh, labeled car source. And is that the proper name of it? Yes, sir. There is another location that is on the southwest corner of that intersection. Do you see where I'm pointing? Yes, I do. It is labeled on that map car source. Is that accurate? Yes, and now uh, they use two different names. What is the other name they use? Car doctor. When we're talking, if it's helpful, if it's okay with you, can we refer to that as car doctor? Yes. Okay. And to be clear, that is the location, car doctor, where you spent almost the entire evening uh, on the, and mostly on the roof, fair to say? Correct. There is a third location at the corner of 63rd and Sheridan that is also marked car source on that map. Is that accurate to call that car source? Yes. Okay. Is it correct to say that your plan personally that night was to guard the car doctor location? That is correct. Had you mentioned you had last worked for these folks about a year before this, fair to say? Correct. Had you ever worked at that car doctor location? Correct. Were you familiar with the things that had been inside the building when you last worked there? Yes. When you were there on Tuesday night, August 25th, did it appear that some of the property inside had already been moved out of there? Some of it, yes, but so not all of it. A lot of the mechanics, tools, and diagnostic equipment, things like that? Mm, not a lot of it. There were still uh, actual mechanic benches still in there, the actual rolling benches. So those were still in there. I don't know if they were possessed any tools inside them, but there were, from my knowledge, tools still inside the building. And I tell me if I'm wrong, but when that location was being used to do mechanic work or detailing or whatever would be done, there would typically be cars that needed to be worked on that were parked in the lot. Is that right? Correct. On the night of August 25th, those cars had already been moved out of there. Fair to say? Some of them. And the 63rd Street location, the one farther south, that also normally would be a lot that would be full of cars to be sold. Fair to say? That is correct. And when you were there on Tuesday night, August 25th, those cars had all been moved out. Correct? Not all of them, no. You indicated that on the night of August 24th, you were helping to put out fires. Is that right? That is correct. Was that at the car doctor location? Yes, it was. Where were the fires? In the parking lot right next to it. Were they cars that were on fire? Yes, they were. Not the building itself? No. And you said that on that particular night, none of the owners of the company were physically there helping to put out the fires. Is that right? Yes, it is. So they were relying on you and, and other folks to do their work for them? Correct. Similarly, the next day when you spoke to Sam or Sal or both of them, the plan was you were going to guard the property or be there at the property, and those owners weren't going to be there anymore, right? That is correct. They were going to pay you a couple hundred dollars? Is that, is that correct. right? correct. And you never got any of that money? No, I did not. You indicated that your personal plan 
at the car doctor location was to spend the time up on the roof. Is that right? That is right. And you didn't feel you needed a gun up on the roof. Is that right? That is correct. I did not. How were you going to protect the building from the roof? I had multiple other friends there with uh, rifles. So they were the ones? Correct. Who were going to be protecting it with their rifles? Correct. I was providing overwatch. What does that mean? I was watching the building. Over, I was watching the building from the roof, making sure that nobody went inside or damaged the property. Uh, the building. The cars were burnt, so we didn't care about the cars. So whatever cars were left on that lot were a lost cause? All of them. You were worried about the structure? Correct. That entire night, there was no damage to that, that structure? That is correct. No fire, correct? Correct. No stolen machinery or equipment, correct? Correct. You said that you didn't see any reason why you would need to confront anyone with a gun that night. Is that correct? That is correct. Is that because you didn't feel that using a gun to protect a building was appropriate? Yes and no. Um, it was appropriate in the needs when the situation would arise, but at the moment, throughout the nights that I had previously seen, was not required. What sort of situation would arise with regard to that car doctor building where you would feel it would, it would have been appropriate to use a gun? judgment what he would consider appropriate for him might be a, a different judgment than another person could lawfully reach was there ever a time on the night of August 25th where you saw a situation with regard to the car doctor building that you felt it was necessary to use a gun no You were shown a photograph that was taken uh, of you earlier in that evening. Were you wearing the body armor in that picture? Yes, I was. Can we put that picture up back again, please? That's exhibit number six, uh, number 30. So, Mr. Smith, you are the individual wearing the white hat with the red cross on it, is that right? That is correct. What does that hat mean? Oh, sorry. Um, where's the... Oh, okay, good, thank you. Okay, cool. Okay, so you have this white hat with the red cross on. What does that mean? First aid. Was that your way of letting everyone know that you were there to treat people that had a medical situation? Yes. Did you ever treat anyone? No, I did not. So help me understand, why wear a hat telling people that you're there to help when you're up on the roof and can't? Provide an aid for my guys up on the roof. So your intent was to let the three or four other people that were going to join you on the roof know that if they needed help, you were there for them? Correct. Did you have medical supplies with you? Yes, I did. What kind of medical supplies did you have? Uh, I had what's called an IFAC, an individual first aid kit, which has chest uh, seals, clotting powder, um, tourniquet, and uh, that's about it. A couple other medical supplies, gauze. Did you ever have to use any of that? Uh, no, I did not. So it's fair to say that despite the chemical bomb, the bricks, and whatever else was going on at the car doctor location, no one in your group got injured? No. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say, yes. You indicated that once you got up on the roof, you really weren't aware of where the defendant went the rest of the evening. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say, yes. You were asked earlier, about Joseph Rosenbaum. And I just want to be clear, 
as you sit here today, a year after all this happened, you know who Joseph Rosenbaum is. I do know, yes. At the time, that night, had you ever heard that name before? No, I did not. And looking back, do you remember encountering him at all that night? Not at all, no. I'm going to ask you the same questions about Anthony Huber. You know who he is as you sit here today. I do know, yes. On that particular evening, did you have any idea who he was? Nope. Did you ever see him as far as you remember? No, I did not. Same thing with Gage Grosskreutz. You know who he is today. Yes, I do today. On that evening, had any idea who he was? Nope. Ever remember seeing it? Nope. So these rocks or chemical bombs or bricks or whatever was being thrown at you on the roof, you are not here telling us Joseph Rosenbaum was doing that, right? Correct. I could not see who was throwing them. You, and maybe I misheard you, I thought I heard you say at one point that you had non-lethal? Yes, that is correct. What do you mean by that? Pepper spray and a pepper gun. What is a pepper gun? It shoots pepper spray out of it. I just want to make sure I understand. You listed pepper spray and pepper gun. Are those two different things? Um, I believe at the time that I had what they, uh, it had pepper balls in it. I don't think it was actually like pepper gel. It was a pepper ball gun. And that's something that you carried that evening because you could use that to defend yourself if there was a need. Correct. Deter, not defend. Deter somebody. If, if the situation arised, I could deter whoever was coming at me. Okay. Do you mean deter, like scare them off or? Correct. Ward them away? Correct. Did you ever have to use that? No, I did not. You indicated that after you heard the shootings, the defendant came back, you described what he looked like, and you said he had said he just shot someone and that he had to, correct? Correct. Did he ever say who he shot? No, he did not. Did he ever say how many people he shot? I do not remember. Did he ever say anything about the, the condition, like whether those people were armed? Uh, he did not say anything about them being armed. Did he ever say that they threatened him? I do not remember. Did he ever say he feared for his life? Do not remember. Did he ever say anything about any weapons that he saw on any of the people that he shot? No, I do not remember. And he didn't tell you how many people he shot either? No. I was a little confused by the end of your testimony because on one, in one statement you said you told him to go outside and turn himself in, correct? Correct. But in another statement you said you left because you were fearful the protesters were coming to that location. I left after I told him that. So help me understand, if the protesters are coming, you assume these protesters were coming to harm you or the defendant or members of your group, right? Correct. So putting the defendant outside was going to put him in danger, right? Yes, it would have, yes. If the uh, protesters were coming, yes. Did you know whether they were coming? I did not know whether they were coming or not. From the roof, you could see the line of police cars along 60th and Sheridan, correct? Correct. So you knew the police were there? Correct. In fact, by that time of the evening, the police had pushed all the protesters south of 60th, right? Correct. There, was, there were no more protesters around that car doctor location, correct? Correct. As far as you could tell, there was no more danger to that building, fair? Correct. Why were you still there? Um, to just watch over the building the rest of the night. I mean, the prior nights, uh, a lot of the stuff had died down or so we had thought. Uh, there was fires around 8 o'clock the prior nights, and then later in the night, around 2 a.m. on the first night is when uh, car source got lit on fire at 2 a.m. So you were planning and staying all night? Correct. Up on the roof? Correct. But after the defendant comes back, you leave? Correct. Why? I was in fear that uh, protesters or the crowd would retaliate or any means, and I, at that point, had deem that build in a lost cause. If you didn't know how many people the defendant had shot and you didn't know who they were, why did you assume it was the protesters that were going to be upset with the defendant at that moment? I do not know. You told someone else in your group, Joanne Fiedler, that the police were coming to the building, didn't you? I do not remember.
So you never came back to that location and told Ms. Fiedler that the police were coming to the building. Is that correct? I do not remember. I mean, it's been over a year, so I do not remember. Obviously, if you think the defendant should have turned himself into the police at that moment and the police were coming to that building, you would have wanted him to stay there, correct? Correct. I have nothing further. Redirect. I just have a couple questions for you, Mr. Smith. Um, Mr. Binger had asked you if there was ever, an ending, ever a time that night at the car doctor that you felt it was appropriate or necessary that firearms would be used. Do you remember that? Yes. At any point uh, on the 25th, were you ever at the car doctor? Were you ever attacked? I was not. Did anybody ever threaten to kill you at that location? I do not recall, no. Did anybody threaten to kill you to your face? Meaning no. they walked up to you and said, I'm going to kill you? No. Did anybody chase after you that evening? No. I have nothing else. Any question? No. You may step down, sir. Raise your right hand. Do you sign before the testimony about to give this matter be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You may be seated. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, ma'am. Oh, hello. Uh, will you uh, please state your name and spell it for the record? Joanne Fiedler, J O capital A N N, Fiedler, F I E D L E R. And Ms. Fiedler, I don't need to know your specific location of address, but can you give us uh, the city that you live in? West Bend. And um, how old are you, ma'am? How old am I? Yep. Yeah. Sorry. There isn't one, I guess. Sorry. Um, are you employed? Yes. And what do you do? I don't need to know where you work. Just can you tell me what I you work do? in manufacturing. Um, you were, if I'm right, interviewed by the FBI as it relates to. Uh, the incident on August 25th, 2020. Is that right? Correct. Now, if I could ask you, uh, in the summer prior to August 25th of 2020, um, there's been conversations and testimony about civil unrest throughout the country. Was that something that you were paying attention to? Yes. And can you tell the uh, jury what you were thinking about it, what, if anything, you did about it, things like that. Well, I understood um, when BLM was, wanted to march, we were all with them and everything, but then they started destroying their own communities, and I didn't believe in that. That really struck me hard. And then uh, the 71-year-old business owner that got beat down, that bothered me a lot. Veterans bother me a lot, and the elderly bother me a lot. And, and children, of course, too, but that just didn't sit right with me. And, and you keep hearing everybody always saying, somebody's got to stand up, somebody's got to stand up. So was there anything based on the, your feelings that you did in relation to that? Can you repeat that? Sure, was there anything that you had actually done? Uh, any groups that you started, anything oh, you participated yeah. Yeah. in as it relates to um, kind of what you were observing? In yes. Actually, we started a, a patriot group. It's uh, United Citizens for Patriotism. We wanted to show support for the country, um, support for the police, because you know, they were asking to be defunded, um, support for all the emergency workers that were going out there into these riots, uh, cleaning up, firemen, 
So just everybody that serves their country, our community services, and just show support for them. And we just stood out with our flags to let everybody know that, you know, we were thinking of them, we were there for them. We tried to do food drives. Um, we tried to get the fire department involved. Uh, we got the police involved, but everything was limited or they were, weren't able to bring out their trucks to do community things because of COVID. And um, prior to August 25th of 2020, uh, did you know who Kyle Rittenhouse was? No. Uh, had you ever had, to your knowledge, any contact with him whatsoever? No, none. And um, so this, this group that you had talked about, that you had stood out and kind of waved flags, um, were there other people uh, relative or uh, as it relates to this case that were part of that group? Yes, yes. There was uh, Dustin and Danton. Okay. So me and Danton more or less started it with an, another guy in the, in the area and then just more people came up to see what was going on and just talking to him and what we, you know, what we were standing there for. Uh, we met Dustin that way. Does the name Ryan Bulch mean anything to you? Yeah, he had, he had walked up one day when we were standing, um, I think three weeks or end of July, beginning of August, walked up in his military uniform and started talking to the guys. I didn't really have communication with him at that time, but he was talking to the guys and made friends with them. So if I could then kind of direct your attention to uh, 25th, 24th, 25th of August, um, was there a time then that you had uh, made a decision uh, that you were going to come to Kenosha? Yes. And when was that, if you know, when was that decision made? Um, just after seeing all the, the violence and the fires going on, um, I just got a phone call and said, hey, we're going to go down and help protect businesses. Do you want to come along? And what date was that, if you remember? I think it was the 25th, correct? I, I'm not, you tell me. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, it's the 24th or the 25th. Okay, and based on that call that you got, um, was there some kind of plan put in place or some discussion about what you were going to do? Not that I'm aware of, I just know we were driving down. Okay, and who were you driving with? I was driving with Danton Merritt's. And were there, so it was just the two of you? Just the two of us to start, yes. Okay, so you said just to start, were there other people that, that are relevant to this case that were part of that? Yes, we met up um, at a park and ride and met um, Dustin and Ryan. And that's Ryan Bulch? Yes. And if you, if you know, at about what time do you think that you met up with them at the park and ride? Uh, Five-ish. No. Okay, so five-ish on the 25th? Yes. And did you know of any specific location you were going or plan that was in place on what you were going to do when you got there? I didn't really have the specifics. No, I didn't know of any plan. So to be fair, you drive down with Danton, Mertz. Yes. Where do you go uh, in Kenosha, do you remember? Yeah, we came down um, Sheridan and we wound up at the car, car source on 63rd. And was that just you and Danton or was it, was Ryan Bulch and Dustin also there? With Ryan Bulch and Dustin, they were, they are, they were in front of us, we were following them. So and they pulled in there. Sorry, and to your knowledge, um, was car source, going to car source just kind of happenstance, meaning was it a plan that was in place, Tino? To me, it was just a happenstance. And when you, about what time do you think you got there? Uh, it had to be at least seven-ish if I estimate the time, how long it takes to get here. And when you got there, um, who was there? Uh, Nick was there, he had the... No, hold on. Nick is Nick Smith? Yes. Did you know Nick Smith before you got there? No. Okay, so you met Nick Smith that day? Yes. Okay, so Nick Smith is there? Yes. Sorry, I interrupted you, go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, I seen him, we got out, uh, he came up, introduced himself, and then we met what he, what Nick introduced us to was the owner of CarSource. Okay, and 
Do you recall that person's name? I didn't. He gave me like the full Indian name. I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to repeat that. I don't recall. Okay. Um, when he entered, when he was introduced to you, did he do anything? Did he just shake your hand? Did he just look at you? What did he do? Oh yeah, he was happy to see us. He was crying. He was thanking us. And I, I even commented, I heard you had cars that burned down because we did drive by that when we came up to that business. And he, uh, excuse me, he had told us that he had over a hundred cars that were burnt that night. So now, I'm sorry to interrupt. When you said he was crying, there's various, there's crying, happy crying, sad crying. Do you recall? No, it was sad crying. You would, well, I, I, I don't know if it was sad or happy. I, I know he was happy to see us, but I know he's sad about his hundred cars, you know, the situation. So, um, exhibit 30, which is this picture, I just want to make sure there's, you're the, if I'm right, you're the person third from the left. Yes. Is that right? You have the, the white hat on or yes. helmet on? Yes. Okay. And uh, is the person that's on the left of that picture, is that the person who you would say was crying? And is yes, that that that's the man that Nick introduced as the owner. And after you were introduced uh, to the owner, what happened after that? Did he stay? Did he leave? If you know. He just disappeared. I didn't see where he went. He just disappeared. We parked our cars and just met back there then. Now, is this the location that you met Kyle Rittenhouse at? Yes. And I think you had said um, you had met him before but was he there when you got there no so he showed up after you were already there yeah i believe we actually took two pictures before kyle showed up and if you recall um of those people who did he show up with if, if you remember uh dominic which i think is on the right of kyle the guy that's on the far far right yep your far right okay. yes and was there a, so after you take this picture, is there kind of a plan in place on what you all are going to do? Uh, just from what I remember, um, Nick wanted to split us up. He mentioned there was three businesses and he wanted to split us all up and one group go here, one group go there. Did the person on the far left, the owner of the car source, did he ever tell you to leave? Did he ever did he ever say that to you? No, not at all. Did he ever tell you that you were trespassing and he didn't he didn't want you there? No, not at all. So you leave and where do you go? Uh, we walked up to the 59th in Sheridan business. It was kind of kitty corner where he had all the cars burnt down the night before. Okay, and who, if you recall, went with you? Um, that was Nick and me and Dustin and Danton and Ryan. I think there was another kid in there, which I don't recognize, and then Kyle and Dominic. Now, if you know, was there a, was there a, any discussion about you said that the owner said, or somebody said there were three locations. Was there, was there a plan to protect all three? Were you just assigned to one? Do you know how that kind of played out? As far as I recall, it was just to protect the one on the 63rd in Sheridan, and the other one was on the 59th in Sheridan. And you went to the 59th? Yes. Um, so when you get to the 59th in Sheridan, are you, are you armed? Yes. Okay. And what what do you, what kind of what are you armed with? I carry a three eighty pistol. Okay. So in that picture, is that pistol somewhere on your person? Um, I don't know if it was yet. But you're not disputing that you had one. No, I'm not disputing that at all. Okay. And when you go to the 59th Street car source, where are you located? Meaning, do you? Are you, we've heard testimony about people on the roof, people on the ground. Where are you? Oh, I'm on the ground. 
And can you tell us who else is on the ground with you? Um, Kyle, Dustin, Ryan. Yeah, the four of us were on the ground. So how close to you is Mr. Rittenhouse at the 59th Street address? Five, maybe five or ten feet to my left. So at that location, he's standing near you for at least a portion of the night? Yes. And when you see him at that location and he's with you, um, what, is he, what is he doing, he being Mr. Rittenhouse? To begin with, or? Well, we, you're, you guys are just there on, the, on 59th uh, as the night is progressing. Right? Yeah. Is he doing anything? Is he staying there? Is he leaving the property? What is he doing? No, he was staying there. We were all staying there. Okay. Um, there's been conversations about, and I'll ask you if you look at that picture, there's a, that little orange box in front of him. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Was there any time during that evening that you saw him doing anything other than simply standing there? Oh, yes. Okay. Can you tell us what you saw? Yeah, I'm sorry. He, um, there was other people that did walk by before like the bigger crowd of the protesters came through and he was offering medic services we had a girl walk up that I don't know if she broke her ankle or twisted her ankle that he actually helped bandage her up so she could walk out because her boyfriend had to kind of carry her and when he did that when he was doing that um, did he ever ask you for any assistance in terms of as it relates to his firearm yes and what did he ask you to do he just asked me to hold on to his gun, and I did. So he would take it off, if I'm hearing you right, he would take it off, and then while he was working on whoever had walked by and asked for help? Yes. And... <coughs> that evening, do you remember seeing the man in the front? Yes. Okay, with, I'm talking about the man with the red shirt on. Correct. Okay. Did you know who he was that night? No. You didn't know his name? No. Okay. Do you remember him from that night? Very distinctly. Okay. Can you tell the people on the jury why you remember him? I remembered seeing him with his red shirt, and the thing that caught me was the green earring. And this was when BLM had just come down in front of us, and there was some other gentlemen that were talking with Ryan. They were talking, things were calm. And then I saw him, and um, it was kind of a back and forth because I had some of the female protesters that were standing in front of me taunting me. So they wanted, they were doing Black Lives Matter, right? And I just, wasn't taking a side, I was just there to protect a business. So I would look and survey and go to them and I would look and survey and I would see Rosenbaum um, standing there and I saw the plastic bags in his back pocket. I didn't know what it was. Um, and then, can I, can I go on? Well, uh, is there anything that he had said that evening that you took notice of or would remember? Yeah, that's the part I was kind of getting to is, okay. um, I know you guys call him Mr. Yellow Pants and that's kind of what we called him. He jumped up on the car and everybody started screaming, get off the car and Black Lives Matter was screaming and he was shouting and Rosenbaum started shouting back at us that he's gonna, pardon me judge for saying this and everybody else, but he was gonna kill us motherfuckers motherfucking niggers and cut our hearts out. That gentleman on the screen there said that? Yes, okay. multiple times. And um, what was every, what was your group's response to that, if any, when he said that? None, we just, you kind of are frozen at the verbiage and the threats coming out of them. I mean, the whole night was quite shocking, but we didn't really do anything. We just kind of stood there. You, you have to ignore that. Was there anything um, else that you saw him do uh, that you remembered? Yeah, um, 
Yellow Pants was screaming. I saw that. I was going back to the uh, ladies that were taunting me and going back and, and looking at him. And as I looked at him, I saw his arm go up and like something, like he lobbed something. And then within seconds, my eyes started watering, my nose started watering, I started coughing. Um, I, I didn't know what a chemical bomb was. I didn't know, all of a sudden I just heard guys screaming, chemical bomb, chemical bomb. And I just pulled my mask up. Did you see him specifically throw something? Yes. Do you remember what it, I'll ask you this way. Do you remember what he, th I'm not asking that you say he threw a bomb. I'm asking if you know what was in his hand that he threw. Yeah, he went back and threw like that. Do you remember what he threw? Meaning, did he throw a, what was it? I don't recall. Okay. That evening, did you, while he was in your purview, your sight, did you see uh, Mr. Rittenhouse threaten anyone? Oh, no. Did you see him point his gun at anyone? No. Was there anyone there that um, <laughs> had, I guess, strike that. Um, after you see Rosenbaum, does what you say he does. Uh, do you see Kyle stay there or does he leave that location? Uh, it was later in the evening after uh, the police finally moved him down. We were all standing outside because we kind of thought it was over. And then you just heard the ruckus going on down by the gas station. I think it's the ultimate. And then we heard gunshots. And that's when Kyle and uh, Ryan and Dustin and Lurk, I think his nickname was Lurk or Work. Okay. Um, they, then they left. So did you see, well, I'll ask it to you this way. So you heard, are you, are you telling me that you heard gunshots and then Kyle left? Yes. And if you recall, how close in time was that to about 11.50, if you know? Oh, to the, I, I'll ask it to you this way. How close was it in time you know now that Kyle ended up uh, being chased by Mr. Rosenbaum and shooting Oh, him, that right? was way before. Way before. Yes. Okay. So what I'm asking you is later in the night, was there a time that you were aware that Kyle tried to get back to you? Oh, yes. And couldn't? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's been a while. Um, so we did see him because I, I was standing right along the wall. So I was like the first person when you came up to the business. So I was standing up front and I was watching because the Bearcats were all right there by the intersection and the gas station was right on the other corner. So he did come back. He had his hands in the air and he even said, I'm working over at that business over there. I could hear him telling the police that. And they told him, no, turn around, you can't go through, you have to get back. And we were even yelling, let him through, let him through. Did you see him then turn around and go back? Yeah, I thought he was going to go back to the ultimate gas station. It looked like he was going over there, so. And is that, is that the last time before the shooting that you saw him? Yeah. Now, from your location, you don't see what happened with Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Huber, so let me finish, with Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Huber, and Mr. Grosskreutz, right? Yes, correct. Do you see Kyle after that? Yes, I do. When? Um, I think after everything had happened, um, he had come back up. I heard from the guys on the roof, they're like, open the door, it's Kyle. So I opened up, because we had to keep the front door locked. Um, I opened up the door and he kind of came running in and kind of fell into me and there was a chair right there so he sat down there. I saw him and saw him after everything had happened. How did he look to you? Uh, totally in shock. Can you give me some physical uh, descriptors that would make... Yes, I'm sorry. Kind um, of you he was pale, uh, sh uh, shaking, uh, kind of stuttering, stammering his words, he was sweating. 
Do you recall him saying anything? Yes. He he had come in and he did. So he looked at me. He said he said right out that he had shot someone, and he kind of sat down in the chair and he was looking for his brother. He's asking for his brother Dominic, and he sat down. I remember him pulling his hair back, and he pulling it back really hard. And just his comment was, "My God, my life might be over." And just we're just like, okay, calm down. Did it, a, after he said his life might be over, did anybody ask him anything about the circumstances about what had happened? Yeah, uh, Dustin had come in at that time, and Dustin had commented. Dust, Dustin was kind I'm gonna, of. I'm going to check. Yeah, to don't. Safe. Fair enough. Don't. I don't want to know what Dustin said. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Did I'll ask it to you this way then? Did Kyle respond to anything that was said? Yes. What was that? That was that he had to. Um, after he said that, do you know? Did you stay? Did you leave? What happened? No. Um, he wanted his brother Dominic, and I know Dominic was on the roof. Um, I took his gun. Uh, like I said, he was just shaking, so I took his gun, I ran out back, uh, I set his gun on one of the trucks out back, and then I went up the ladder and I called the guys and I yelled, Dominic, get down here. So he came down, and when I came back in, they were talking. And you had, My last question or two is, you had said that you had used, uh, you had climbed up a ladder to get up on the roof. Yeah. You just said that. Okay. Um, where did you... Do you know where those ladders came from? Um, no, I okay. know we went in the business when we first got there, and they were all in the back. So it's like a building, and then there's like a back parking lot that's fenced in. Okay. And in that back, fen uh, back fenced in areas where they have the sheds and all, and Nick went in there and pulled everything out, and that's how the guys have got up on the roof in the back. During the evening, um, throughout the evening, uh, was was there a period of time that other than doing medic work or medical work uh, that you saw Kyle doing anything else to kind of assist in the community? Um, yeah, actually me and Kyle ran, excuse me, <coughs> we ran, I think it's north. Is it this this way up Sheridan? I don't, can't see so it. <laughs> Sorry, my direction is a little off right now. When you point, <laughs> something I would do. So it's, if you can, are you going this way? Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm moving that. That would be, the parties will agree, I think. Yeah. That's right. Oh, yeah. Towards St. James Church. All right. So, so we ran up there because there was, um, they were starting a fire on the um, plant, the plywood doors. They had covered up all the doors and they actually started, or whatever they, whatever you call it, fluid, whatever you want to start a fire, they threw it all over that door and we're trying to start the front door of the church on fire. So me and Kyle had actually run up to that area to try to put the fire out, but somebody, people that were running along with the protesters had gone up there and, and put the fire extinguisher out and then we just walked back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Ms. Fiedler, it's about with the church. Neither you nor the defendant actually put out any fire at the church. No, not at the church, no. Someone that was with the protesters did that. I believe they're with the protesters. You spoke to the FBI on August 31st, 2020. Is that right? I'm not sure about the date, but yes, I spoke with the FBI. About six days after this all happened? Yeah, probably, yes. And you told them that you contacted the defendant's mother the, the morning after all this happened and told her to be strong. Is that right? Probably, yes. You also said that after this incident, <coughs> you had been in contact with the defendant's attorney. Is that right? Uh, no, I, don't, I read that and I don't know what he meant by that because I wasn't. I've never spoke to him. 
So you've read your statement to the FBI? Yes. That was a statement uh, that was a summary of what you said to, off, to Special Agent Tim Walther on August 31st, 2020. Is that right? Yes. And in that uh, summary, it says that, in addition, Fiedler has been in contact with Rittenhouse's attorney, John Pierce, regarding the incident and has provided information she deems helpful to Rittenhouse's legal defense. The, uh, actually, the only thing I ever sent was any kind of video that I had. That is it, which I didn't have much. I'm not a video person. So as far as verbal communication, no. Did you provide video to the defendant's attorney? I might have. I don't know if it was mine personally. I really don't remember because I don't even have it anymore. But shortly after this incident, whether it was your video or someone else, you gave something to the defendant's attorney to help him. Fair enough? I don't, would, yes, I guess, yes. And you don't have that video anymore? No. And you didn't provide it to the FBI? Uh, that's not true. I gave them everything I had. You gave them that video? I gave, yes, I gave them everything I had. I showed them my phone. I showed them anything I had. You, you gave them text messages? I gave them everything I had. So when you say that I gave something to the defense attorney, I don't think that that was my video. I think it was probably a video I seen or something I passed along because I didn't take any video. So it's fair to say that whatever you gave to the defense, you were trying to help the defendant, correct? Yes, I was trying to help the case, not just the defense. And you have watched a lot of the videos that have been put out on the internet of this evening, correct? That is not true. Have you watched any of them? Yeah, I've watched some of them, yes. The reason I ask is because you reference this, these words that Joseph Rosenbaum allegedly said to you and the members of your group. That's not on any video anywhere, is it? No. So you are from West Bend, correct? Yes. You don't live here in Kenosha? Nope. You don't work here in Kenosha? Nope. You've never worked at CarSource? Nope. Never bought a car at CarSource? Nope. Probably had never even heard of CarSource before all this. No, I haven't. You came down here that night with no plan of where you were going to be, what businesses you were going to protect, or anything along those lines. Fair? I personally had no plan, correct. You were coming down with a group of other people from the West Bend area, correct? Yes. You knew there was a curfew in place that night? Actually, I didn't. You knew that they were closing off the on-ramps, off the interstate, so yes. people couldn't come in from out of town to our community like you, correct? Yes. In fact, that's why you came down a little earlier, to try and beat that, didn't you? No, that is not true. You brought along a 380 pistol? Yes. You were going to use that to protect property? And myself, yes. How were you going to use that pistol to protect property? Sometimes a presence speaks louder than a lot of things. The presence of what? The presence of having the gun and being there at the business. Were you openly carrying the gun? Yes, I was. So you didn't have it in a holster or in a I waistband? I did have it. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was on my side in a holster. But you figured if people saw that, they'd be scared off? Somewhat. Like I said, it's a presence. It's knowing that somebody's on the, on the, um, in the area, on the ground, standing there. It's kind of a deterrent to keep them away from the business. And you'd agree with me that the AR-15s that the rest of the group had was an even bigger deterrent, correct? A gun is a gun. And, well, a gun's not just a gun. You're, how many guns have you, are you familiar with in your life? Uh, quite a few, we grew up with them. Including rifles? Rifles, shotguns, yes. AR-15s? Yes. So you understand there's a big difference between an AR-15 and a pistol, correct? Between an AR-15 and a pistol, yes. There's a size difference. One's much bigger, correct? They can all do the same thing. One's much bigger, correct? Size doesn't change what can happen or what it does. Ma'am, did you hear my question? Yes, it is much bigger, yes. Can you please answer it? 
I'm sorry, yes. The AR-15 fires a different cal caliber than handguns, correct? Yes. It fires at a, at a higher velocity, correct? Yes. It is capable of doing damage to some a target much farther away than a yes. pistol, correct? Yes. In fact, AR-15 rounds are capable of penetrating body armor, correct? Oh, I did not know that. Okay. So you followed this group of people coming down from the West Bend area to the 63rd Street car source, is that right? Yes. Before you got there, you had no idea where you were going, you didn't know anything about car source, anything like that, fair to say? Correct, yes, correct. You said at that time you met up with someone who identified themselves as the owner of that location? Yes. You personally didn't have any interaction with that owner, did you? Yeah, I had a conversation with him. Do you remember speaking with um, Steve Spingola, a, uh, an investigator, with regard to this incident? I couldn't recall names, but... On September 8th, 2020, you had a phone call with him at about 5.30 p.m. Do you remember that? Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't recall what... You said you've seen your statement to the FBI. Have you seen the statement that you gave to investigator Spingola? Uh, I guess not, no. Let me... Uh, May I approach your honor? Sure. Well, I think you should first ensure that she acknowledges the conversation because up to this point, she says she doesn't know if she had such a conversation. And so I'm so trying to help. Go help. ahead. I'm going to show. <clears throat> Ms. Fiedler, I'm going to hand you a document here. I'd like you to take a look at it. Take your time. Okay. And uh, please let me know if you've ever seen that before. asking you if it's accurate ma'am I'm just asking if you've seen it before well no I've <clears throat> never seen this okay fair that's answered my question thank you yep <clears throat> you told this individual Mr. Spingola <coughs> that you didn't have any interaction with the owner of car source that night didn't you no I don't even recall the conversation and that's not true decided that night that you were going to protect the location at 59th and Sheridan. Is that correct? Well, that was decided for us, but yes, that was the end plan, yes. Who decided that? Um, I believe that was the owner and Nick Smith. That was the first time that night that you'd ever met Nick Smith? Yes. You didn't know anything about him before? Nothing. And yet, based on his decision and the owner's decision, you agreed voluntarily to go to the 59th Street car source to protect it. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's fair to say. Nobody made you do that? No, correct. You indicated at one point that the defendant asked you to hold on to his gun while he was helping someone. Is that right? Yes. Can we get that? Do we have it with us? The gun? Can you get it out, please? Do you recall how the defendant was wearing that gun that night? Uh, he had the strap around his shoulder and body, and then the gun pointed down. Is it fair to say that the gun was sort of hanging down the front of his body in the middle? I think when he was walking, yeah, but I know when he was standing there, he, he, he would always have a hand on, across the front of it, okay. so yeah. I'm going to ask Detective Howard to hold on to that gun uh, and show you. Check it again. Check it again, please. Have you both confirmed that it is safe? Okay. 
could you uh, stand back a little bit, Detective Howard? I want you to be where the jury can all see you. Why don't you step a little bit this way? Uh, Ms. Fiedler, can you uh, tell us in your own words, and I'll try and have Detective Howard sort of demonstrate, how was the defendant holding that AR-15 when he was on the 59th Street property, if, if you know? Well, the strap was over his shoulder. Okay. Yep, on your neck. Would the gun hang loose or would he hold on to it? Just like that. Okay. So holding it with his right hand on the pistol grip? Yes. And sometimes holding it with his left hand or not? Depending? That could be, I don't recall. Okay. I'm pretty sure that's how, how but when it, it when it came time for him to help someone out, he took it off and asked you to hold on to it. Is that yes. right? Okay. Thank you, Detective. You indicated that there was a time in which some females came to the property and were taunting you. Is that yes. right? Yes. And you indicated that they were chanting Black Lives Matter at you? Yes. And you took that to be them taunting you? No. They were saying other things. You'd agree with me, though, the only thing you've told us so far is the words Black Lives Matter. Uh, yeah, but I could go into the whole story, but we'd be here all for a while. You also said that there was a man wearing yellow pants who jumped up at a, on a car. Is yes. that right? Was that one of the cars that was on the lot? Yes. And the members of your group told him to get off the car, didn't yes. they? Yes. And, in fact, pointed a gun at him while telling him to do that, correct? Yeah, uh, he pointed his gun at us first. Oh, the man in the yellow pants had a gun? Yes, he had a gun. He and had then, a couple guns. And then your group pointed guns back at him? I don't know who pointed a gun at him. I don't know if they did or not. I didn't. I was busy watching my areas. So you indicated earlier that you brought along your pistol to protect yourself and property. Is that right? Yes. How were you going to use it to protect property? It is, it is lawful to be armed while protecting one's property. It is not lawful to use deadly force in the protection of property. And it's important that we not get confused. And I'm not trying to confuse the issue, Your Honor. I'm asking how she was planning on using the pistol to protect the property. I don't believe, I think I'm, I was going to come back to it. How, how are you going to use that pistol to protect property? Like I said, it's a deterrent. You weren't planning on firing it to protect property, were you? No. You weren't planning on aiming it at anyone to protect property, were you? No. You indicated that, that Mr. Rosenbaum made some statements, and I'm not going to repeat them all. But uh, you indicated that no one in your group responded to anything he said. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's very fair. You said you pretty much have to ignore that, correct? Yes. It's fair to say you didn't consider him an actual threat to your safety at that moment, did you? Not for the distance and for the group that was around, no. Mr. Lukowski characterized him as a babbling idiot. Would you agree with that? I didn't hear him babbling. I just heard him, well, I don't know if babble's a good word, if I may. He was just bitching. He was a little guy, right? I, I, I thought he was like the same height I am, but. How tall are you? I'm well, five, four and a half. You said he, Mr. Rosenbaum's arm went up and he might have thrown something, but you have no idea what it was, correct? Correct. You were then asked about a period of time in which the Kenosha police pushed the crowd past the 59th Street location. Do you remember that part of the evening? Yes. And this is the time period when the defendant has uh, gone south of 60th, and you said he tried to come back at one point, etc. You remember that time period in the yes, evening? Yes, yes. There were no protesters around 59th Street after the police pushed them back at that time, correct? That's not totally true. There was an empty lot directly across the street from us, 
and there were protesters that were walking on the other side of the bureaucrats. The police were screaming at them to get away from there, and they just kept walking through. After the police pushed the crowd, did any protesters come and stand in front of the 59th Street car source? After they pushed them past yeah. 60? They didn't push them past 60, excuse me, past the gas station. <coughs> let, me, let me make sure I'm being clear here. Okay. Ms. Fiedler, I'm going to use the pointer here on the map behind okay. you. And just, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this map, so let me, uh, yes, there's, a, there's a location on the map that is marked car source, and that is on the southwest corner of 59th Street and Sheridan Road. You'd agree with me that that's the property that you were at the whole evening, correct? That's south, the one you were pointing at? Um, I'm pointing, you can see where I'm pointing. Yes. That is on the southwest corner. Oh, I'm sorry. Of 59th Street and Sheridan Road. Yes. You'd agree with me that's the property you were at all evening, correct? Yes. And there's a time when the police move down Sheridan, past that location south, and establish a line of armored and police vehicles here across the intersection of 60th and Sheridan. Do you remember that? Yes. After that, no protesters come back to 59th Street, correct? No, that's not true. You talked about the time when people were walking through the pile of rubble. Is that right? No. Who, what, that. what protesters came out and stood in front of 59th Street car stores after the police pushed them past? They didn't, well, the police also turned their bearcats around and backed up, and all the protesters then came at us, and bricks were flying, bombs were flying, everything. They came at us with full force. That's why I had to go inside. Okay. And I apologize. I probably have not explained myself properly. Let's go to the end of the evening. You remember the the defendant coming back, the shootings, all that. Leading up into that, the, f the few minutes before that, that was the second time that the police had pushed everybody down to 60th, correct? Yes, correct. I'm talking about that period of time, at the end. After that, when the police come by that final time, the protesters have all been cleared south of 60th, correct? No. You remember protesters around 59th Street car stores after we that? We were pelted. For almost the whole night, from after the Bearcats backed up, they came and they bombed, they bombarded us, and then they left again because we had come out again. And we, they heard sh shootings and some other people had left, but then they came back at us, and I was in inside the building basically probably the rest of the evening. You testified in response to one of the defense attorney's questions that you thought it was over when the police pushed the protesters south. Correct. And they stopped there. That was before they had backed up. We had thought it was over. Okay. So you talked about the defendant returning to the 59th Street car source location. Yes. Correct? Now let's be clear. You never saw any of the shootings in this case? That's correct. You uh, don't have any personal knowledge about any of that stuff, fair to no. say? No, yep, none. You've been asked about Mr. Rosenbaum. At, the, at that evening, you had no idea what his name was. Correct. You've described what you saw about him that night, correct? Yes. As you sit here today, you know there's a person by the name of Anthony Huber, correct? Yes. That night, you never saw him once, correct? No, I don't. No, I have not. You'd agree with me it's correct. You've never yes, seen Yes, I'm it. sorry. Yes, you're correct. You know now, today, there's a person by the name of Gage Grosskreutz. Is that correct. yes? Correct. That night, never saw him, had no idea who he was. Correct. correct? You indicated that when the defendant returned to your location, he said to you that he had shot someone. Is that right? Correct. Meaning one person. That's what someone is, I guess. He never said to you he shot three people, did he? No. He never told you that any of those people had a gun, did he? No, he didn't really describe anything about what had happened. He never told you that any of those people threatened him in any way, did he? No. Nope. He never told you that any of those people had any weapons on them, did he? No. Correct? 
Correct. I'm sorry, you did answer. There came a time in which Nick Smith came back to that location and said the police were coming, correct? Yes. And after that, all of you got out of there, correct? Not immediately. In your FBI statement, you said soon after Nick came into the location and stated that police were coming to the building. Everyone then left the building. Correct? No, no, I had to go get the guys off the roof. But then everybody left, correct? Yeah, we came down and everybody else that was down there previously was gone, yes. Including the defendant? Yes. After hearing that police were coming, correct? I, I thought they left with Nick. I didn't know. I have nothing further. I just have a couple questions for you, Mitch. Okay. Um, you were asked about Mr. Rosenbaum and there was questions about uh, how you would describe him and how others had described him. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Um, did you ever have any direct contact with Mr. Rosenbaum? No, it was just it was just that when we were standing at the 50 or yeah, 59th Street, just seeing him when Yellow Pants was jumping on the car. So Mr. Rosenbaum had never directed, if I'm right, had he ever directed any threats specifically to you? No, not specifically to me. Had he ever physically ran after or chased you? No. When you said that you were being harassed, or I think that's the word you used. Taunted. Taunted, sorry. Um, what were some of the things they were saying to you? Uh, they were calling me out, uh, come on Blondie, come on out here, um, not so tough, put your gun down. Yeah, as soon as I didn't give them their power sign, they just got a little bit more aggressive because they were actually kind of friendly at first. Everything was very friendly at first. When you, um, Mr. Binger said you never actually saw Mr. Rosenbaum throw anything. Remember him asking for saying that? Yes, he, I remember. Okay. Is this fair? After you saw his arm move, did you see a gas bomb explode? I believe that it landed on the roof. I don't know because immediately, like, the eye started watering, the noses started running. So I can't say that I saw anything like that. No. And Mr. Binger was asking you questions about you never, uh, what uh, Mr. Rittenhouse didn't see when he got into the building. Right? He didn't tell you specifics about what happened. Is that true? Correct. But he did say that he had to do it. Is that right? Yes. I don't have anything else. Any question? There we are. Let me step down. Okay. Let's take a break, folks. Uh, please don't talk about the case during the break. Uh, read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Attorneys, uh, here are the uh, six photographs which were um, graciously sent to us by uh, the photographers. And um, please take a look at them. Uh, unless you have objection, I intend to offer them as the next six sequential exhibits. Uh, get in the record. Any objection to the receipt of these uh, uh, well, photographs? I understand. Are we going to be able to use them in the case? Sure. They're exhibits. The reason I had them prepared. I'm trying to make a record. Sorry. I do. Okay, go back to your mics. Go back to your mics. The state doesn't object. All right. Uh, I'm going to, I received these. I, uh, this is not an unusual practice that I will have a photograph taken either by one of the litigants or myself. 
uh, so that it's better in the record than just somebody trying to describe what's being portrayed. So I had the photographers who were kind enough to uh, take these pictures, and um, they are now exhibits A through E. Um, in the record, is there any objection? And they are exhibits in the case which you may use if you wish. Okay. What time do you want to start, Judge? Um, I didn't. I didn't say that. But uh, how about uh, Friday? <laughs> 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 um, how about uh, uh, two forty-five?